Good morning, my name is Martha Green, and uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, those of you who are online, um, I welcome you, and also want to share with you that we are in the middle of a series called The Good Life, and it's found in the wisdom literature of the Bible, and today we're going to be looking at the problem of envy, envy. Almost everybody craves the good life, don't they? But the longer I live, the more I realize that I would say the majority of people don't know exactly what the good life is. And we do have this 4,000-year-old body of wisdom literature in the Bible that tells us about what the good life is. But the forces in our culture, be it advertising or social media, exert pressures on us with false notions about what the good life really is. And these forces tell us that what we have is not enough. They try to persuade us that more is better, or at least something else, something we don't have, is better. And it affects us in some of the most commonplace areas of our lives that we do every day. Have you noticed that when the sign on the freeway says 60, you're prone to go 65 or 70 or even 75? Yeah, I won't ask for hands on how many do that. And you know, when I've been envious of someone taking a wonderful strenuous, steep, long-distance hike like our director of music, Diana Green, does frequently on a regular basis, and I know I'll probably never be able to do it like she does it, but I'm always happy for her. I'm happy for her. And I'm not envious, but I'm happy for her. I'm sort of envious, actually. <laughs> Oh, and I'll say, you know, I'm green with envy. <laughs> I'm playing on the sound, not the spelling of my last name and hers. That expression, by the way, do you know where that expression comes from? It comes from the famous play Othello by William Shakespeare, where Iago says to jealous Othello, beware, my lord, jealousy. It is a green-eyed monster. And have you noticed how Google has become a knowledgeable master of our purchasing habits as well as our age? I, for example, am, seem to be battered with multiple ads for hearing aids. <laughs> and if I buy sheets, from Macy's, Google seems to know it, and then from then on in my inbox or on the Internet Explorer, I will get a barrage of ads, of betting ads. Have you noticed that? There's nothing wrong, I suppose, with this kind of marketing. That's how Google, Facebook, and Twitter, or whatever Twitter calls itself now, I'm not sure. And it is how they pay their bills. It's how they pay their bills. But it takes away my own decision-making process about what I really need. And this Google monster tries to convince me that I always need something more. We have words for this, covetousness, jealousy, envy, but at the root of all three is discontent with what we have and wanting more. The tendency to always want more or, what, or to want what you think you don't have starts very early. Who has seen this scene that we're going to see up here? Give it back to him, Granger. So 
do you know what I mean? Uh, this problem starts very early. This problem of what he, wanting something that you don't have. Anyway, the Bible suggests that the innate presence of envy has been with us from the very beginning of humanity. And it lies in the story of Adam and Eve and many other stories, many other stories, whether it's Jacob and Esau or whether it's David and Bathsheba, God is no stranger to our problem of envy. Anyway, Adam and Eve were told that they should not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And everywhere, all kinds of fruit bearing trees were available to them. But Adam and Eve soon coveted the one tree. The Hebrew word describing their desire is kamed, which means desirable, pleasing, delightful. But friends, the abundance of available trees heavily laden with sumptuous fruit was not enough. To covet is to desire and try to take or to have what you do not have. Proverbs is aware of this problem that is so deep and runs so consistently in our human nature. A number of Proverbs warn about coveting, jealousy, and envy. And our scripture selection for today, the chosen proverb, is a poor man is hated even by his neighbor, but the rich man has many who love him. And that suggests the power of envy of those who have more money than we do. And so the neighbor, your next door neighbor, who is just your regular person, who is there to help often, who's like a brother and sister in adversity, as the psalm says, seems to have less value than some rich person who stands apart from your daily life and yet is fawned over because of his wealth. In the ninth and 10th commandments, we're warned against coveting a neighbor's spouse, coveting his or her house, lands, or his servants. And there's a warning not to covet your neighbor's donkey. Have you had that problem? <laughs> I guess for us, it might be a Tesla, a Mercedes, or a Lamborghini. I don't know. But everyone's got that car that they wish they had. Uh, anyway, it is a warning not to covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Pastors Aaron and Mike have told us that wisdom is gathered by people, by human experience. And there's evidence that the wisdom sayings were widespread all throughout the Near East in many other countries. There are wonderful proverbs that arise out of Egypt, for example. Some of them have been incorporated in, in the wisdom literature. Wisdom arises out of our observing what happens when we covet. But what is interesting is that when it comes to the matter of envy in the Bible, we have this intersection of divine law and human wisdom, and together they articulate powerful warnings and truths powerful warnings and truths. Adam Hamilton, in his book, Words of Life about the Ten Commandments, says this, in many ways, coveting is often the motivation behind our violation of all of the commandments, all of the commandments. Even the first commandment, of no other gods is a form of coveting because we long to pursue other gods, false gods, which are anything that we give our ultimate devotion to. And I have arrived at the conclusion that jealousy or envy is a destructive force that we talk too little about. So let's go deeper today. Let's ask, what is envy? What is covetousness? 
What is jealousy, and how does it harm us? And by the way, how do we understand God's statement in Exodus 34, 14, where he says, I am a jealous God. The late pastor Tim Keller says it best in his book, The Way of Wisdom, and he writes that God's jealousy is for something. He says that God's jealousy is the intolerance of disruptive intrusion and is the mark of love rather than indifference. You can imagine that if your beloved was indifferent to your having an affair, you would wonder what the nature of his or her love for you would be, wouldn't you? And Keller goes on to make a very important dis distinction. That is, sinful jealousy is not for, but of someone or something. What a difference a preposition makes. And when it comes to envy, what, when it comes to en envy, fundamentally wanting someone else's good life is the problem. Proverbs 14.30 warns us of the danger of this kind of envy. A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. It can literally eat you up. Many of us associate envy or jealousy with romantic je re relationships, and world literature is filled with examples of jealousy between lovers. But probably no piece of English literature gives more serious attention to the problem of jealousy than William Shakespeare's play, Othello. And for those of you who don't know this story, I will share with you that Othello is a brave and distinguished soldier of advanced years with a Moorish background in the service of the Venetian army. At the age of seven, he was taken from his North African family by the Turks and sold into a kind of military slavery. He grew up as a Muslim warrior, but at some point he was captured by Venetian forces and converted to Christianity. He continues his martial profession and rises through the ranks of the Venetian army, earning a reputation of great valor. But he had a tendency to embellish his storytelling, and his tales captivated the beautiful Desdemona so intensely that she went against her parents' wishes and married Othello. Iago is one of Othello's officers whom Othello profoundly trusts. And Iago is intensely and secretly angry that a man named Cassio has been promoted lieutenant over himself, and his anger is directed at Othello, who chose Cassio over Iago. And Iago is consumed with jealousy. He envies Cassio's virtues and is filled with hatred and is jealous of Cassio and is jealous of Othello and his position. Jealous Iago creates a scheme to make Othello believe that Desdemona is having an affair with Cassio. He wants to infect Othello with his own disease of jealousy, and so he does. And Othello, gripped by rage, eventually kills Desdemona, but when he learns of her innocence, he takes his own life. Shakespeare's tragedy explores all of the destructive tendencies in human nature. Lack of contentment, quest for power, low self-esteem, a willingness to lie or even to kill, to do anything in order to get what you want. 
But beneath it all lies a fundamental distrust of God in the seasons of discontent. That was Shakespeare, but here's a proverb that describes the tragedy of Othello. Proverbs 26, 4. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? There have been volumes written about Othello, the seemingly endless literary analysis of Iago's motivation reflects a truth, and it is simply this. There is a devil in human form that may be lurking around and within us, perhaps within even a most trusted friend. But it is even more disturbing to realize that this devil may be a portrait of our own destructive tendencies. What then is the antidote to this destructive tendency to covet that lives within all of us? And the antidote is trusting that God knows better what we need than we know about what we need. Our ideas of what is good for us are not always the same as God's ideas about what is good for us. And Paul emphasizes this in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that means that whatever we lack, even blessings such as basic needs or health, we will, in spite of these trials, be formed by God to look more and more like Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis described this process in his classic book, Mere Christianity. He says this, Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew that these jobs needed doing, so you were not surprised. But soon he starts knocking the house down in a way that hurts abominably and does not make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing in a new wing here, putting on an extra f floor there, running up, to running up towers, making courtyards. And you thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace, and he intends to come and live in it himself. I need to remind myself continually that envy of others is often wrapped in illusion. Melissa Kruger, in her book written for women called The Envy of Eve, remembers being at a small gathering and speaking with a good friend whom we shall call Elizabeth. Elizabeth was in her mid-30s and struggling with discontent after a long season of singleness. Over time, she had become bitter and started to feel shortchanged in life and focusing on everyone else's blessings in comparison to her own state and condition. And during that conversation, Elizabeth saw a mutual friend named Amanda arriving at the party. And Amanda was cuddling her new baby in her arms. And Elizabeth then said to Melissa, well, look at Amanda and her baby. She finally has it all. She's been hoping for a baby, and now she's content. Melissa remained quiet. She knew something about Amanda that Elizabeth did not know and which she, she could not reveal to her. Just a few weeks before her due date, 
Amanda's husband had confessed his unfaithfulness, which led to a variety of painful consequences. And so while Amanda was cuddling that baby, she was internally struggling each day with the painful repercussions of her husband's revelations about his infidelity. But her struggle was private. Friends looking over the fence and comparing our life or life stage or circumstances with another person's stage or circumstance is just fraught with danger. We do not know what goes on behind the seemingly perfect life or a seemingly perfect family. In fact, I can say with some confidence that each one of us here today is trudging through a life where there are seasons of joy and seasons of despair. And when I find myself in a season of trial, these are the disciplines I try to appropriate to avoid discontent and resentful longing. And I want to share them with you today. First is the practice of the discipline of gratitude. Gratitude helps to fill the emptiness of not having enough. And I commit to not being green with envy, but green with gratitude. Secondly, daily I try to practice the discipline of generosity. Did you know that spending on others is associated with greater happiness? Regardless of your income level, helping those in great need helps increase our sense that we do have enough. And finally, loving and serving others. Every day I ask myself, did my interaction with this or that person, and it might be a barista at Starbucks, or it might be the voice on the phone of my lawn service with whom I'm currently not happy, (laughs) did my interaction cause the other person to feel closer to God and goodness, or farther from God and hope. If you find yourselves right now in a difficult season and feel discontent or envious, remember C.S. Lewis's extended metaphor that with every trial, God is building a house in you in which he intends to come and abide and live. These antidotes against envy, however, are not heavy burdens. They're like guardrails and signposts. They direct my path and they lighten my load. They help God build a palace in me where he intends to take up his residency. May this be for you as well. May it be. Let us pray. Oh God, we, we know that we are born with envy, wanting something more that does not belong to us, wanting something that you don't want for us. Help us to know the good life, to know the destructive power of envy, and help us discover that the key to life is contentment, no matter what state we find ourselves in. But finally, most of all, we know you love us. We know you love us through all of the seasons of joy and sadness. And we also know you're building a house in each person here, a house in which you long to reside for eternity. May we remember this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.